You're listening to The Naked Pravda. This is a relatively new show from Medusa, our first English language podcast, so please don't be shy about recommending us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in. The Naked Pravda. Welcome to The Naked Pravda, a podcast that highlights how Medusa's top reporting intersects with the wider research and expertise that exists about Russia. I'm your host, Kevin Rothrock, the managing editor of Medusa's English Language Edition. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about conspiracy theories in Russia and the United States. You'll be hearing about a few specific theories that may be new to you, like something called the Dulles Plan. And then there's the idea that U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright once advocated seizing Siberia. But this particular episode also grew into a broader look at how Russians and Americans see themselves and each other. And the story is just as often about how we refuse to see ourselves and fail to understand each other. If I'm sounding a little over-philosophical right now, you'll have to forgive me, because the conversations you're about to hear I really enjoyed on a personal level. It turns out that conspiracy theories are fertile grounds for talking about what makes us Americans and Russians, and how what could have been a great friendship has gone so wrong. So how do we get on this subject? Why talk about conspiracy theories at all right now? Last month, Medusa investigative correspondent Lilia Yaparova, whose work we've discussed before in this podcast, wrote an article about a curious course taught by Vitaly Grigorev, a military veteran and former instructor at the KGB Higher School. This winter term, Grigorev's students studying National Systems of Information Security at the Moscow State Technical University of Radio Electronics, Ele Electronics and Automation, one of the biggest technical schools in Russia. These students were tested in a handful of pseudoscience conspiracy theories like psi effects, combat memes, the doctrine of hybrid warfare, other things. Uh, Race-specific weapons, psychotronic viruses, neuro-linguistic programming, and so on. None of these topics uh, science, but the test questions were worded, ironically, quite seriously, in fact. That's Lilia explaining some of the exam questions in Grigorov's class. She says she learned about the test in the first place from one student's concerned relative. Uh, they told me that Moscow Technological University introduced an exam, a big test on uh, national information security which is okay, or it would have been okay, had the test not included questions about several conspiracy theories. The test wasn't just about conspiracy theories, though. It actually presented these ideas as historical facts, including an infamously phony theory called the Dulles Plan, named after and attributed to former CIA chief Alan Dulles. According to the mythical Dulles doctrine, uh, the CIA chief Alan Dulles had developed a plan for the United States to destroy the Soviet Union by secretly, secretly corrupting moral values of the Soviet nation by introducing drugs, for example. And this conspiracy theory gained traction about 30 years ago, right after the collapse of the USSR. And to hear it in 2020, from the lips of one of the uh, lecturers in one of the largest technological universities in, in country. Well, it was both funny and sad at, at the same time. At this point, you might be wondering, who is this Vitaly Grigorev guy? He sounds like some wacko in a tinfoil hat, right? He's not some uh, man in a tinfoil hat. He's uh, actually a well-respected university lecturer with strong ties to the Russian military. He's a veteran of military service. He also taught at the higher school of the KGB. He's close to the Russian Security Council as of now. He's a passionate researcher. He published several articles on information warfare, color revolution, psychotronic viruses, and um, judging by his um, scientific work, uh, there, there's uh, chaos inside his head, a mix of pseudoscience, uh, <laughs> the information theory, and anti-Western sentiments, of course. Listeners who remember Lilia's last appearance on this show, when she talked about her reporting on Kremlin-supported search technology that draws on illegal databases, will know that she has a deeply nuanced grasp of the subjects she studies. 
Asking her about that article last year, I recall being surprised and intrigued when she took a moment to defend the intentions of the technicians who created those, those search systems. Talking about Vitaly Grigorev, she's careful again to humanize the people in her stories. And she acknowledges that writing about him in the first place probably only encourages his worst instincts. I don't think his lectures are dangerous for the students. As far as I know, Grigorio's antics make them laugh, and that's so. He believes himself to be mm, a great military commander of a kind uh, in a future information war, but he's uh, just a victim, in my opinion, a victim of Cold War ideology and some very bad research. When we talked, I, uh, I inadvertently encouraged his worst fears, I believe, that there's a war against him personally, and me and my critical questions are just a weapon. For a conspiracy theorist, a conspiracy theory to them is just the truth, it's just reality. And the only way, to my mind, that you can go about differentiating between the two is look at the evidence. That's Scott Radnitz, an associate professor in the Henry Jackson School of International Studies and the director of the Ellison Center for Russian, East European, and Central Asian Studies at the University of Washington. His research is on post-Soviet politics, focusing on things like protests, authoritarianism, identity, and state building. He's writing a book about the role of conspiracy theories in the politics of post-Soviet states. I asked him what separates a conspiracy theory from a conspiracy. The answer him is not all that complicated. If the evidence is there, um, then that's a real conspiracy. However, there's nothing simple about studying conspiracy theories from a scholarly perspective. When you're a political scientist, where do you go for all that juicy, precious data? So for the project I'm working on now, it's focus groups, it's two large surveys that's in Georgia and Kazakhstan. But the biggest part of this uh, book manuscript is a database of conspiracy theories going back uh, to 1995 of conspiracy claims uh, from 12 post-Soviet countries. That includes Russia. Uh, and I try to trace the evolution of, of particular ideas across space and across time. And what does it mean? What does a database of conspiracy theories mean? Like, what is that exactly? I, w I had research assistants search Russian language uh, newspapers, mostly newspapers and some other sources, uh, to identify individual claims. And if they fit those criteria, I collect it and then... I code it by who is making the claim, what their position is, what country they're from, who is the perpetrator in their claim, uh, what the per that person's position is, uh, what country they're from. And after collecting a bunch of these, uh, I can look for various patterns using statistical analysis. So in all this number crunching, what did Scott actually find? In most post-Soviet states, it turns out, conspiratorial political rhetoric is most prevalent in countries with more competitive politics. So one thing I found in my work is that it's the, the competitive regime, so it's called hybrid regimes, where there's actually a real political competition, you find more conspiracy claims in politics than in dictatorships. So uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan have many more conspiracy theories appearing in, in politics expressed by politicians, presidents, ministers, security officials, spokespeople for the government, than in places like Belarus, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, where there's less competition. But not so fast. Since you're listening to a podcast about Russia, you're probably wondering how Russia fits into this pattern. It doesn't. It's an exception. Ah, right. So Russia is a big outlier here. Russia is the only case among these 12 where you have a mostly non-competitive regime that nonetheless uses conspiracy theory extremely frequently, which shows that there are different paths to conspiracism. Conspiracy theories aren't unique to the former Soviet Union, obviously. Scott says Americans, especially in recent years, are generally more conspiratorial than people in Britain and Europe. But the weirdos, so to speak, are the countries where conspiracy culture is weak. If you look around the world, actually, I would say it's it's normal and common and expected that ordinary people, again, are suspicious of the people in power. And there are good reasons for them to feel that way. So maybe a more interesting question is why do you see conspiracy theories in politics occurring in different frequencies in different places? While it might be normal to have a conspiracy culture in most places around the world, the particular nature of that culture differs widely. Kind of the history of these cultures are pretty much different. Ilya Yablokov is a specialist in media and communication studies and the history of Russian media 
and he lectures on these subjects at the University of Leeds in the UK. In his book, Fortress Russia, Conspiracy Theories in the Post-Soviet World, he says Americans and Russians share a messianic idea about themselves, whether it's a city on a hill or the third Rome. But major conspiracy theories in the U.S. are often populist and grassroots, he says, while political and intellectual elites are the top producers of these ideas in Russia. Conspiracy theories, as we know, emerge in the times of troubles, in the time when social structures collapse, economic uh, situation is getting worse. Politically, it's, it's, there is a lot of unpredictable things. But people who work, who has an experience of working in law enforcement services, that it's kind of a, you know, um, convenient way of thinking of how the world works, right? So there is one power center that kind of sets out the, the plan, the agenda, and the methods of how to achieve uh, uh, kind of this, the, the goal of the plan and kind of then, then the officers and various people in this kind of involved in this scheme start working towards the goal. Speaking of conspiracy theories in Russia's security apparatus, let's get back to one of Vitaly Grigorev's test questions, the one about the Dulles plan. Ilya says this conspiracy theory has particularly enamored people with Grigorev's background, especially since the fall of the Soviet Union. For many officers of KGB and FSB in the, in the 1990s, Kind of the Dallas plan nicely explains how exactly the Soviet Union collapsed and what is going to happen next. For them, it's 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 a way of legitimizing why they that why they should resist. And what about another conspiracy theory that's enjoyed wide support from Russia's security community? The notion that U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright has a pathological hatred of Slavs and supposedly once proposed seizing Russia's natural resources in Siberia. Ilya has written about this and suggested that the Kremlin deliberately legitimizes the theory. I asked him how we can talk about the former concept as a conspiracy theory, and how we can talk about this latter speculation, that the Kremlin deliberately promotes the idea, how that is scholarly analysis. It's actually, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's traced back to some like mind-reading program in, in the Soviet intelligence. Let me emphasize that uh, Madeleine Albright never said that. Right, sure. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, but, but but the guy Boris Ratnikov, who is who kind of the original article in the Rossiyska Gazeta, uh, the official newspaper of the Russian government, um, this article appeared in two thousand six. And Boris Ratnikov said that he kind of tested his skills of reading minds of people, and that once he tested his skill on reading the brain the mind of Madeleine Albright. So it's in that sense, it's kind of, it's, if you think about it, it's kind of, it's rubbish, right? But then interesting, what was the reaction of Vladimir Putin? He, he neither agreed or disagreed. He said, certainly, he said, I never heard her saying things like that. And it's in that sense, he's right. But then he kind of, he, he does, Kind of he, he on the flip side, he says, "Okay, but I'm pretty sure that there are people out, out there who wish to have the control of our natural resources, right?" And so he got in that sense. He says, "Well, I'm not sure about this particular quote, but I'm pretty sure there are people who do and who who thinks who think similarly." And and what is interesting next? What is what for me as a scholar is interesting here? What is the goal of this speculation. We read interviews with very important Kremlin bureaucrats who repeat the same theory, but they do not question that anymore. They, they put it as a fact. Well, Madeleine Albright did say that, right? You see, so there was a kind of less than 10 years difference between the two events, between the, the article in Rossiska Gazeta and the actual comment of the very high-ranking uh, Kremlin bureaucrat, but from allegedly said that, this theory evolved into she actually said that. Despite the Kremlin's apparent role in boosting some wild ideas, Ilya says it's important to understand that state decision-makers in Russia are generally scared of true conspiracy theory fanatics. And that's a good thing. What is good for all of us is that at least there are sane people in the government and in law enforcement services that, that actually are kind of trying to keep the balance 
in the state and kind of use use conspiracy theories instrumentally. I think whenever uh, you have a, a true fan of conspiracy theories being in the power, that is something that scares a lot of people in the presidential administration and in, in, in politics in general. If you only focus on conspiracy theories as a center of your platform, you're going to fail. Because apart from separation and kind of and radicalization in society, conspiracy theories are not bringing anything. It's not a solution to the problem. Conspiracy theories are reaction to the problems, but they are not delivering solutions. I'm not trying to whitewash them. Let me let me repeat that, right? I'm not trying to say they they they're good chaps. They do have their own sins, uh, but but at the same time, they are not really into kind of making conspiracy theories the center of political agenda. It's just one of the tools, critical tools, when when the when the help to the Kremlin isn't needed. Whenever whenever they encounter a, a crazy kind of the person who doesn't really feel what what is appropriate, what is not, as a, what we call adequatni, right? Adequatnost. Uh, whenever they feel that this person is neadequately, this person, this conspiracy theorist is not going to be a part of the kind of of the political elite. I think one of the reasons that people are so subject to believing stories that I don't even know how to put it, stories that I would say are false, that people in the reality based community would say are false, is that um, we are all always making assumptions about our choices. You know, the, the phrase is choosing your rabbi, right? So, um, which is a really bad phrase to use in conspiratorial circles, come to think of it. That's Elliot Borenstein, a professor of Russian and Slavic studies at NYU. In his most recent book, Plots Against Russia, Conspiracy and Fantasy After Socialism, he says American narcissism and historical ignorance are the stuff of dreams for contemporary Russian culture. As someone who regularly interacts with foreigners, I personally remember some embarrassing things about my own American self-identity. The narcissism, first off, of course, we have the notion of exceptionalism. I think we have what Russia, post-Soviet Russia, would love to have, which is a unreflexive, unselfconscious assumption that the whole world is about us. And, you know, the country's big enough, and we have the American superculture that dominates mass culture to a lesser extent than it used to, but still to a large enough extent. We have the predominance of English so that most people can go throughout their day without even really thinking about what happens in other countries. And they'll parrot back this idea that, you know, we are the greatest country in the world or we are the freest country in the world. When people say that, it's like, what are the people suffering in chains in the Netherlands? You know, there's no, there's no real reality checking here because we're so self-satisfied. So I think the narcissism is really clear, and now we're being run by narcissism, so it's kind of um, poetic injustice. I have, to, I have to confess, when I was a kid and I used to think about places outside the United States, my first thought of stepping outside the country was what color is the sky? Because in my, oh my mind, <laughs> you could only have like a blue serene sky in the United States. And it was like some, it was going to be some variation on like, you know, red blood or something. <laughs> like it, I couldn't fathom that like the earth was the same. <laughs> wow. For me, for me, I had a lesser thing, which is like, there are people out there who don't know what Star Trek is. Oh, that's pretty scary too. I know. That's less less of a thing now. But it really amazed me that that was possible. And that was mostly about the Soviet Union because the rest of the world probably was more likely to know it. But in terms of uh, lack of interest in history, again, history is just completely not valued here. Um, and I I don't even know how to support it. It just seems so obvious to me, like the, the air we breathe and the blue sky that we own. Um, that there's really absolutely no interest in, in historical precedent in, in, in the power of history was in Russia, of course. I mean, this is a cliche, but it's very true. Russians are, re are educated in their schools from a, very, from a very early age to think about history, to think about Russian historical context. One of the reasons that I think history is more important to Russia than to America is that talk of Russia's greatness tends to rest on past accomplishments, like, you know, saving the world from fascism. With America, 
um, America, Americans, for whatever reason, don't seem to feel the need to list their accomplishments. They just assume the greatness. Whereas in Russia, um, very often in certain types of conversations, you hear the litany of the great things that Russia has contributed to the world. They've contributed writers, they've contributed composers, they were the first in space. All these things are absolutely true. But the fact of the litany, I think, is really revealing of a focus on accomplishments and a need to a need to remind others and remind oneself of how great and truly great the country is. Ellie and I talked at length about Russophobia, which in his book he compares and contrasts to prejudices like anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-Americanism. For example, discursively at least, anti-Americanism and Russophobia are deployed in largely the same way. Criticize the White House, and you're anti-American, you're not a patriot. Criticize the Kremlin, and you're a Russophobe. But there are some major differences, too. Um, one of the differences, though, is that anti-Americanism throughout the world, I believe, and based on, on my readings and also just on um, casual uh, film viewing and reading and life, and all that, is that anti-Americanism ranges from um, hostility towards America as a country, hostility towards American government, and also a stereotype about a certain type of American person, the ugly American, like the American abroad wearing his shorts and um, with a big belly and uh, talking really loud, whatever, right? Whereas, you know, there are some stereotypes about Russians, certainly, but for the most part, the things that are being identified about, about, uh, as Russophobic are not about a sense of Russians as a people, because in, in fact, I think in America, at least, most people have a very, very dim sense of what it means to be a Russian at all. It is about the Russian state. Now, from my point of view as an American leftist individualist, right, when the state is a victim, frankly, it doesn't move me as much as when, when individuals are a victim. However, that is very much me being a product of my environment because one of the big things that I think is at the corners, as a cornerstone of Putinism for the past 20 years is seeing the state as the subject of history, the state as the subject of, of everything rather than, a, the, rather than a group of individual people as the subject. So the state is the hero and therefore, if you're offended on behalf of the state, that is legitimate because the state really then means something. Whereas for me, I can't get offended on behalf of the state. I don't really care about the state, but that's very American. But I, I think the fact, if you think of it as a fact, the fact that this has worked suggests real resonance with the idea of wanting there to be a state that you can rely on and um, be proud of. You know, in, in American English, you don't talk about the state unless you really hate the state, right? I mean, we're, um, there's a very kind of anti, anti-statist, anti-central government rhetoric um, in our country, and that, of course, is not not the rhetoric you hear, at least in the in the main main media in, in Russia. You know, this kind of reminds me. One of the first times I was in Russia, and I was it was at somebody's dacha, and you know, it was like campfire, or not campfire, but like a fire, or whatever, barbecuing. And there was this one guy who was very clearly eager to ingratiate himself to me, the kind of like visiting American. <laughs> and the conversation went on this 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 uh, route where he it, it eventually. I wasn't quite sure where he was going with it, but eventually what I realized was he was telling me a long story about why the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima were justified. Oh my God. But it was, but it was, so, it was it, it, the context at least, maybe for all I know, he was a diehard fan of those two decisions, but <laughs> I got the impression eventually that he was, this, that was his effort to kind of like show that he was not hostile to Americans. But it's, it's funny because read through the prism of, of, you know, this, this, uh, the, the self-identifying kind of system you've painted, it makes perfect sense because he was showing me that he had, you know, hospitality or, or warm feelings about American state actions. Whereas for me, that didn't make, at the time, made no sense at all that why is this person who seems so nice talking about, you know, the, the goodness of, of dropping, you know, atomic bombs or whatever. Right. I mean, if you, if you want to go to, to, to um, big generalizations, I think that that sort of thing has a better homology in the American South when people are talking about the Civil War and the Old South and talking in this nostalgic way that makes a lot of people on the left and a lot of people on, of, of color really uncomfortable because there's this habit of feeling that if you love where you're from, you have you you cannot accept criticism of of, of um, things that your nation or your your region has done in the past. You have to whitewash everything. So we've established one theory explaining why Russophobia is so offensive to so many Russians. But how did we get to a place where America, almost whenever it's mentioned in Russian political discourse, is described as Russophobic? Even as an American who specializes in Russia, the inescapable thought that haunts my mind almost every day is that, for better or for worse, but probably for worse, most Americans do not care about Russia. 
Certainly not before Donald Trump. Until recently, until the whole um, Trump-Russia scandal, um, the thing that cracked me up most about Russophobia is that Russophobia was so flattering to Russians who were, in, who were invested in Russophobia because it assumed people are paying attention to Russia. In the United States, almost no one was paying attention to Russia. Well, um, in the Russian media, they're going on and on about American Russophobia. And, you know, Russia, at that point, Russia should be so lucky to have Americans paying enough attention to bother to be afraid of them or to hate them, frankly. Go back to the debate between uh, Romney and Obama in 2012, when Obama makes fun of Romney for, for identifying Russia as the number one threat against the United States because it seemed absolutely ludicrous. And Obama referring to Russia as simply a regional power was probably one of the most offensive thing he could have said um, uh, to, to uh, people in the Russian government and, and ultimately, I think, did not do us any favors. It's remarkable to the degree to which Obama is vilified in Russia still today. I mean, amazing. given his relative popularity in the United States and the fact that he didn't invade Iraq. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's, it is, it is kind of, it's, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's a little discombobulating to, to go to Russia and mention Obama and to have people talk about, I mean, the first thing that people mention to me usually is Libya, which it, to be fair, yeah. Americans just kind of forgot about. So, right. you know, right. that's the point taken, I think, but, but, yeah, but, yeah. but it, it, yeah, I mean, I do think that, you, that you're right that, it's it's the fact that he offended them so as much as anything maybe in the book you say that you talk about the the 90s as being this important moment for russians because they you know they well they be, they ceased to be soviets and became russians and the, one of the biggest thing one of the the biggest shocks in addition to all the you know real world shock therapy and all that stuff is that they discovered after decades of infatuation with america that it was not reciprocated yeah and th I thought this was a really interesting idea because it's again another thing that I've I've I don't know if I've tried to convey it to Russians because it's a little offensive, <laughs> but it, but um, but I've certainly thought it. And it's it's also interesting because you know you, you often the, when you talk about when Russians kind of turn the cold shoulder to America, you, the, the thing that's often mentioned is the you know the Serbia intervention and so on. And so the concept of like of a, of a of a moment of being offended and then relations changing is a familiar one, but I hadn't seen it phrased quite this way. For decades in the late Soviet period, uh, American mass culture was fascinating and often the forbidden fruit, and it was it was something that was being sought out. And people learned about America, and people read American authors, and saw whatever American films they could find, and listened to American music, and so of course they were absolutely fascinated. In America, no one was doing that with with Russian mass culture. And there were very few people interested in Russia. However, there was a great deal of interest in the Soviet Union as an enemy. That interest in the Soviet Union as an enemy, for a lot of people, for people like me, perhaps for people um, similar to you, uh, made it something that was particularly interesting because maybe they're not just the enemy. Maybe there's something um, completely different going on there. And you discover this great, amazing Russian culture. But the larger motivation behind any American interest in the Soviet Union had nothing to do with culture. However, people in the Soviet Union could, could assume it had to do with culture because, of course, their love with, for America had to do with culture. And if you had any kind of encounters, since there were so few encounters between Americans and Soviets, they were usually encounters with Americans who were really interested in, in Russian culture and in Soviet culture. But that was very much the exception. And given that so much of the interest in America had to do with mass culture, Soviet culture really didn't have anything, have much to offer um, people outside of its world to, to fascinate them in the same way. And once the Soviet Union collapsed, the only way Russia was interesting in the news was as a problem, Russia in crisis. It didn't matter if people were writing wonderful novels. It didn't matter if people were, were making great movies. America went back to just not really paying attention. And that is, I think, deeply wounding and deeply offensive. And it says as much, as much about American narcissism as about any need by people in Russia to be, to be recognized. Um, it was always one-sided, but it was never clear, I think, over in the former Soviet Union how one-sided it was um, until the walls came down. It's, I mean, it's worth pointing out probably that it was to America's detriment that it was so one-sided because we stood to, you know, learn a lot and make a friend potentially, and then we didn't. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But I mean, if you want to introduce people to um, American culture, you can just give them some some um, great popular music. If you want to get people really into Russian culture, you give them a 500-page Dostoevsky novel. <laughs> um, and I love the 500-page Dostoevsky novels, but they're a harder sell. All right. At this point in the show, as we near the end of the episode... You might be asking yourself, Jesus, is this guy ever going to stop shitting on Russia? The answer is yes. 
Before leaving you, I want to turn back the clock about a century to the U.S. in the World War I era, when American and state officials, not the benighted grassroots or the populist yokels, promoted and devoted themselves to some particularly nasty conspiracy theories about African Americans and the Bolsheviks. You get this new Negro movement, this radicalization of black politics. That's Sean Guillory, a historian and the host of the SRB podcast, a weekly podcast on Eurasian politics, history, and culture, and the digital scholarship curator in the Russian and East European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. His recent research focuses on black leftists in the early 20th century, including the conspiracy theories American officials deployed to explain away the era's race riots. If you've seen the new Watchmen series on HBO, you already know more about the subject than you might realize. You also are having a lot of racial violence in the United States, particularly the high point is the the red summer of 1919. If you've watched the, the HBO series, The Watchmen, it opens with the Tulsa massacre in 1921. So it's all part of this wave of racial violence all over the United States particularly in urban areas like Chicago in the summer of 1919. And the American government and the FBI basically see communists or Bolsheviks behind this racial violence, even though the vast majority of it is perpetrated by whites against blacks. And it really is, I think, comparable to uh, pogroms that you see against Jews in the former Russian Empire and during the Russian Civil War. But, you know, because of the, the paranoia and the Red Scare at the time, they see the American government and the, the Bureau of Investigation, which later becomes the FBI, basically see this as a Russian plot. And a lot of it, I think, is the reason why they, they see these machinations of, say, Bolshevism uh, feeds into a, a two-pronged form of racism. First, anti-Semitism, uh, in the sense that Jews control, you know, various people behind the scenes. And at the time, of course, both in the United States, but, you know, mostly in Europe, Bolsheviks and Jews were seen as one and the same, right? This Judeo-Bolshevik myth on the one hand. And then also, I think that the perennial racist idea that we see all the way up to the present, that African Americans don't have political agency on their own, they must be controlled or instigated or riled up stirred up by some outside force or some outside agitators. And we see this throughout the 20th century during the Black Freedom str Struggle, where either it's Bolsheviks, i.e. Russians or Jews. You see this in the 20s or 30s, you see it in the 40s, 50s and 60s. And to some extent, you kind of see it today with this whole idea of Facebook and Black Lives Matter and Russian trying to stir up the races again. Uh, you know, during 2016 and whatnot. So, it, I think it's part of a longer history of of seeing race problems in the United States as being, um, you know, prodded or fired up by outside forces. And, and Russia has played a, a major role as, a, as one of the, the forces to blame for this in the 20th century. So, was this all made up? Did American black radicals have no actual ties to Russia and the Bolsheviks? They did. It wasn't all made up. To some extent, Moscow was even bankrolling the American Communist Party, Sean says. He also says that there was plenty of what might be described today as Russian meddling. But it was a revolutionary time, and the ideology brought groups together. For them at the time, this is, it, it went both ways in the, term, in the sense of the revolutionary times spoke to a, a, an internationalism of the period that really connected oppressed people with one another. Sean sees a common thread in the conspiracy theories about Russia that have captivated and still captivate the U.S. political establishment. In the end, a lot of the appeal boils down to laziness. American intellectual laziness, sure. We heard plenty about that from Elliot. But it's also a moral laziness. Americans' refusal to interrogate their own ugliness. It's a way to kind of explain something that you can't comprehend it also, I think, is a way to deflect actually dealing with the heart of these issues or the heart of the crisis, which is, you know, rampant racial violence against African Americans. I, I think in our own present period, you get, you know, with the election of the, the 2016 presidential election, you get the Russian kind of phantom again, because it, it serves as a way to explain uh, how did this happen? Because, you know, how, does, how did Trump happen in the sense that if you attach some sort of outside force to his manifestation, then he's not from us. We're not the problem. It's some outside force. 
And I think you find this also, too, in the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. You know, Martin Luther King was constantly hounded and branded and surveilled as supposedly as a communist or Soviet agent. And I think this is a similar reason. Like, you know, our, our quote unquote Negroes would be peaceful and content if it wasn't for these outside agitators stirring them up. Right. So it, it functions as both a, a manifestation of a crisis, but also a way to, to kind of explain that crisis without actually dealing with this underlying issues. You've been listening to The Naked Pravda, a podcast that highlights how Medusa's top reporting intersects with the wider research and expertise that exists about Russia. On today's show, we turn to the wider expertise on conspiracy theories. After recalling a Medusa report about a Russian university lecturer who encourages his students to believe anti-American conspiracy theories. A lot of the fun of that article, if it's fair to use the word fun, is laughing at the legitimization of ideas that are simply untrue. But conspiracy theories are everywhere. And they're not just absurd or nasty tall tales. This will sound cliche, but the stories we tell about each other often say more about ourselves than the people over there. As an American who studies Russia, I've always felt a bit embarrassed that my compatriots don't do more to reciprocate a genuine cultural exchange. I may have learned the language and watched Russia closely, but even I find a kind of sick pleasure in wrapping myself in all things American and shutting out everything else. I like that the baseball season ends with the World Series. I don't care if the only non-American team is from Canada. I'm an ugly American, but I can do better. And so can a lot of people, at least some of the time. On future episodes of this show, we'll be discussing the Russian state's push for so-called internet sovereignty, and we'll discuss academic turmoil at Moscow's higher school of economics. The Naked Pravda is a podcast from Medusa, our first English-language show, and I hope you'll recommend us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to help put this program in front of more people. Thank you for listening, and come back soon. Mm-hmm.